Hi, I'm Karen Hurd, and I'm here with our next edition of Asking for a Friend Live. And I am delighted to have my special guest today, Eric Karpinski, author of a new book called Put Happiness to Work. And he is a happiness expert. So, Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely glad to be here, Karen. Thanks for thanks for having me. Sure. The, so the topic and the reason I invited you on the show is that uh, I am hearing from so many leaders recently, you know, I really want to do a good job. I'm trying to do a good job and I am so stressed. How do I how do I manage all this stress? And when I read your book, I was just really that was one of my favorite chapters because, you know, a lot of times people will say, oh, take a walk breathe, you know, and, but this was like really practical, tactical things that you can do to help manage your stress. So thank you for joining us. And I'd, I'd love just to get a few of your insights here to kick us off. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, stress has really gotten kind of a bad rap in our society. We learn everywhere how stress is killing our productivity, how it's killing, killing us, in fact, you know, um, all the health problems that we hear about stress. Stress actually evolved to help us. Like when we're stressed, our heart starts beating faster. We start breathing faster or deeper. <clears throat> our body releases energy into our bloodstream, carbohydrates and fats, all so that we can power up to act. It all gets us ready to act. And if you look, there's just been some amazing research over the last five to 10 years that's talking about ways that we can utilize stress to really meet the challenges we face, <clears throat> to actually step up and utilize the energy right there's all this energy and we 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 can get distracted by it there's so i like to i like to refer to it as kind of a stress response continuum mm. and if you if you um yeah are you, would you throw up that that uh visual yeah, so, so this, 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 is, this visual in your book is fantastic so yeah why don't you walk us through a little bit about this yeah so if you look on the left side uh this is this is the threat response and this is maybe too much detail for everyone to read on the, uh, in the audience, but I want to, I want I, I'll talk to it. The, the threat response is really what we hear so much about, right? And we, 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 we get the threat response when we feel we don't have the resources to meet whatever challenges face, uh, we're facing. It's driven by cortisol and it never negatively affects our performance. See that in the threat response, blood is kind of shunted away from the more evolved parts of our brain. And it means that we can't really think clearly. It means that we really can't choose how we react. And we tend to go into avoidance mode where we're just Facebook, CNN, oh, I think I'm hungry, let me go to the refrigerator, right? You do all these avoidance behaviors because you don't wanna face it. And um, it also our ne narrows our arteries and causes a lot of the long-term health problems that we associate with stress. <clears throat> then if you take, then you flip it. Let's go over to the right side. The challenge response is what happens when, hey, there's something big coming down the line, but I think we've got a shot at, at doing this. I think we can, I think we can meet the need or at least start moving in the right direction. When um, and this activates a whole different set of body processes. It opens up the peripheral of vasculature of the body and the brain, which gives more oxygen and allows us to better process important information. It allows us to see the big picture and it allows us to choose how we respond to that stress. So our heart is still beating fast, and it, but it opens the blood vessels so it drives our blood pressure down, much healthier state. So I wanna be clear, the stress is high in both. It's not that we're reducing the stress and the challenge. It's just a completely different way that we respond and react. And we haven't heard a lot about the challenge response historically because everyone's like, the sky is falling. Stress is terrible. And stress can be terrible. Yeah. But there's a number of ways that we can figure out how do we transition ourselves into a challenge response. And I, I've pulled all those tools into a simple acronym that I call ASPIRE. Yeah. So I want you to walk us through the first step of ASPIRE. But first, you know, one of the things that I really thought about with your book is that you say when you're stressed, it's usually because you really care. And so that's why if you can 
take that caring and you can tap into that caring, that's yeah. where you go from the debilitating to this being in this challenge mode. And I was thinking about so many times over my career where I watched people who were really, really passionate, caring, doing good work, but they were like derailing themselves from executive presence because they were showing up so, and they were losing credibility and they were losing influence because they were reacting to the stress as instead of tapping into that stress. Yep. So, so let's talk about this great model of yours, this Aspire model. Sure, sure. So the first step, and this is, this is a sort of a universal one, um, whenever you feel stress, you need to acknowledge it. First of all, you need to sense it. You need to notice it when it's coming. And then the most powerful thing you can do is just say, wow, <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit of stress. Or I'm feeling a lot of stress right now. Because what's so cool, just that verbal cue changes where we respond and where we act to stress from our sort of um, historically, what do I want to say, our, our less evolved parts of our brain, the amygdala and the, and the limbic system, and it transfers it up to the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of our brain, the most evolved part of our brain, that allows us to use logic and reason, allows us to choose and be just aware of what's happening to us. So the first step is noticing it and, and then calling it out. And I, so there's actually a, a really good, if, if stress is something like consistent stress is something that is a problem for you, what I'd suggest is that you start a habit of doing a stress check-in. You know, either set your phone alarm to go off every couple hours, or you can decide every time you go to the restroom, hey, I'm going to do a quick stress check-in. And all you do is just do a quick body scan. All right, am I feeling stressed? Um, or I, am I doing the behaviors that I know indicate that I'm stressed? <clears throat> and then and you can even jot it down, especially the first few days. It's good to jot down like, oh, so what, 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 what did I notice about the stress? Why am I noticing that I'm stressed? Just jot those things down and just measure how much stress you're kind of feeling on a one to 10 scale. You don't have to be super anal about it, but just keep track of it. And then over the course of two or three weeks, just keep checking in. And when you notice that you're stressed, oh, oh yeah, I'm feeling pretty stressed. And then you can start to move to the next part of Aspire, which is really where we start to actively change um, how we respond. Okay, so first is acknowledging the stress. And do you also wanna think about like what part of the brain you might be in? I, you know, I, I, I have, it's funny because I have two different, I know when I acknowledge my stress, I have two different ways. You know, sometimes I'm feeling like, oh wow, I'm stressed because this is so important and I absolutely need to nail this keynote and get it right. And you know, that's like a, I am stressed. Um, but I'm in a I'm in that positive, energized kind of stress. But like one time, I went to go do the keynote, and they had transferred the the slides to a different program, and all my images were gone. Oh, right, five minutes before I'm walking on stage, <laughs> different kind of stress, right? And yeah. so you know, and 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 so how do you you know, I, later in the program, I know we're going to talk about how do you manage these different yeah. kind of situations. But you know, it, this acknowledgement is like on a scale, like how bad is this is this stress right now, right? Exactly. Yeah. Just be like, whoa, this is intense, <laughs> but I'm feeling really stressed. So what, what is it about this stress and, and how can I do it? And, and those are, those are the indicators. Once you feel it, you notice it. All right. What are the tools I can grab onto? Okay. And um, yeah. And so I think the first, the first one of those is the S of Aspire and that's shift your mindset. There has been an incredible amount of research over the last, again, 10 years. And this has been in employees at LinkedIn employees at a major uh, investment bank, um, high school students, college students, they, they've done a really cool study with um, minority students at MIT, figuring out, and all they do is they train and they just tell people exactly what we did at the beginning of this session, that stress can be good for you. It can help you by giving you the energy you need to face whatever challenge you've got. And that simple brain switch of saying, of, of, not, oh my God, I'm stressed. It's killing me. I, it's going to be terrible for my day. Instead, just saying, oh, hey, this, 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 my heart beating faster is getting me ready to move, to, to act and to, to move something. There's a, um, a study by, at Harvard Business School called, <clears throat> uh, by Allison Wood Brooks. And she did a simple study. Like most people, when they, when they start feeling really stressed, they think, I've got to calm down. <clears throat> I'm supposed to, I, I shouldn't be feeling this. I need to calm down. And so she just did a simple study where she took, I think it was like, 
you know, I forget the numbers, but several hundred students. And she had half of them. And she said, hey, when you start to feel anxious. Oh, so first of all, <laughs> she told him, you're going to have to do a speaking thing. We're going to record you and we're going to judge and evaluate how good that talk is. Mm. Right. So what does that do for everyone? <laughs> Whoa, the anxiety right. level goes up. Even for those of us that are speakers for a living, we still get anxious when we're when we're about to go in front of an audience. <clears throat> and he says, so the first group says, when you feel that, just say, I'm calm. I'm calm. Just tell yourself, I'm calm. The other group, they say, and so that, that I'm calm sort of is going against everything your body is saying to you at that moment because you're not calm, but you're trying to calm yourself down, right? The other group, she said, hey, that energy, let's just call it excitement. Why don't you tell yourself, I'm excited. I'm excited to do this talk. And that simple switch, that was all that she did between the two groups that she did. That simple switch, the I'm excited group was more, people could understand it more. They under, they they got the points. They were caught more confident, more poised. It was night and day between the two groups. Very statistically significant between the two. Just by switching that. Just by That's adding incredible. a little bit of mindset. Because the yeah. circumstance didn't change at all. Because exactly. They all had the same project to do. Changed it, t- t- took down the, the situation that was triggering the stress. It was just yeah. how they were responding to the stress. That's exactly. Really so no, no, re- they didn't see reduction in the amount of stress, but they're going, one group is going with the physiological process, whereas mm-hmm. one is trying to fight it. And so you're kind of creating this conflict of, I'm, I'm, I'm not calm, but I'm trying to, I'm calm. I'm not calm, I'm calm. Right. And so there's this conflict. And so you're fighting the stress instead of, just going with it and like relabeling it and using it in a positive way. Uh, good. Let's talk about meaning because I, I really do believe finding the meaning, you know, well, I'm stressed because what I'm doing here is so important. Yeah. And, you know, how, t- let's talk about how do you tap into that meaning, particularly when you were still in that feeling of overwhelm? Yeah. What I, one of the important things to know is we're only stressed because we care right? Meaning and stress go hand in hand. If you think about the things that are really important in your life, let's say your, your, your relationships, your kid, your children, your big projects. For most people, they also coincide with the things that stress them out the most. And, and it makes sense, right? We're stressed because we care about the outcomes. We care about what's going to happen. So what's really cool is that we can use stress as an indicator of, wow, this must be important to me. What is it about this that's important to me? And if you just take a minute and just say, oh, this is important because I really want to do a good job or I really want to make sure that this cool new product gets out to some people so they can use it. You know, whatever, whatever the reason is, if you can find meaning, particularly meaning beyond just yourself, that's a really powerful thing to remind yourself later when you, when you get stressed again, oh man, I'm so stressed. Oh, that's because this is really important to me. This is something that I care about. This is something that um, Ali Crum, who's, who's one of the top researchers in this field, she talks about, she uses the metaphor of <clears throat> it's a cold, dark night on the side of Everest. And she, you know, you sort of think about it, you're like, okay, so if I'm, my goal is to do something huge, which is climb the tallest mountain in the world, I know that it's not going to be a, an, an easy little stroll up to the top, right? There's going to be cold, dark nights. There's going to be some tough times when I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I want to make it. Maybe I just go back down. And if we're going to do something important, something big, those are going to happen. So let's recognize that. Let's even celebrate it when it comes because it means, hey, we're making progress. You know, we're moving towards that thing that's important to us. Yeah. It's interesting. When we were writing our latest book, Courageous Cultures, there was a three o'clock in the morning moment when I woke up and I thought, Oh no, we have to change the structure. Like we, and and, you know, of course it's close to deadline because that's how, how this stuff works. works. But, and that created a massive amount of stress, but Mm -hmm. it was, but using that stress, it was because I cared. Right. And I, and I went back to Dave and I'm like, I think we have to restructure this. And it created a massive stressful month, but we could have gone the other way and just yep. said, you know what? It's written. It's done. The publisher thinks it's okay. Right. You know, but it, it and it would have been fine, but it yep. wouldn't have been as good as it could if we didn't lean into that stress and, and endure that Everest moment. Yeah. Right? Get through it. And I'm glad we did because now that book is forever. Right. Yep. Yeah. 
Okay, why don't you just uh, take us through a couple of, but just finish the model a little bit here and uh, yeah. give us the, let, let the other two I can do I can do a little little more quickly. Um, by the way, there's a whole chapter in the book about meaning and how do we find more meaning at work. So the two of those strategies really synergize nicely because there's a lot of ways that we things we can do introspective wise and things we can do as a team to 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 tap into the meaning of work, which then. We can use those and apply that when we're feeling when we're feeling stressed, either individually or as a team. So, so let's hit the last two. Um, inventory your resources. Oftentimes, when we first hear of an assignment or a challenge or something big happens, we don't recognize all the things that we have that are will be able to contribute to that. And so we can fall into that feeling overwhelmed of like, I don't have the resources to do it. Oh my God. And we can go, we can jump into the threat response. Mm-hmm. By the way, there's something really important. When we get deep in the activated threat response, it's really hard to get back out. So um, it's important that when we feed, when, when we, we, that's why the stress check-in is so important. We want to be able to check in over time. And as our stress levels start to rise, realize, hey, oh, I'm feeling stressed. Let me tap into the Aspire so I can move to the challenge. Because once you're locked into that, it takes a couple hours for really, really to get out of it. Mm-hmm. So, so if you start feeling your way towards that, you're like, oh, I didn't realize we had to do this. And 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 your stress starts coming. Okay. Step back, take a breath. Okay, we got to do this assignment. What what do we what do we have? Tap into what what are my strengths? What are the things I can bring into this? What are my experiences? How have I seen something like this before? Who is in this with me? Who are my teammates that are going to help me dive in and, and do it? What are their strengths and their experiences? Do I have a budget to hire someone from the outside if I need it? Do I What's, you know, I, I tend to give myself lots of sort of artificial deadlines so that I can get things done. Is this a real deadline? Like, is this real? Or do I actually have a resource of a little more time yep. if I think about it? Yeah. So just giving yourself a minute to really figure out what those resources are can easily transition you because that that challenge response is when, oh, no, actually I've got enough that I can make a good effort for. Nice. Yeah. And then the last one is um, Shelly Taylor at UCLA has done a bunch of research about what she calls the uh, tend and befriend response that a lot of people, and it, it historically tends to be a lot more women, but this is applicable to anyone. When they feel stressed, they, you know, they'll bring out, maybe they'll bake some cookies and bring them into the office and they'll reach out to people to connect and maybe help some other people. It's kind of counterintuitive, right? If you're stressed, you're feeling like, I got to get work done. But some people that makes them want to link up, makes them want to help other people. And of course, you know, you, you can't take on huge burdens of other things if you've still got your stuff to do. But if there's little quick things that you can do to help people, that's going to turn your mind around and actually bring a lot of courage and a lot of ability for you to come back to your own challenges mm-hmm. and move them forward. Oh, that's really good. All right. We have a question. And then I also have a question that has been triggering for me. But uh, so David, uh, he says, uh, asking for a friend, healthy response. What's the healthy response when the source of stress is true overwhelm? You, that there really is more to do than you possibly could accomplish. Yeah. No, I mean, I, that's an important, and I think a lot of people are feeling that. Mm-hmm. So what we what we need to do when we're in those situations is, all right, <laughs> you know, there's there's the, what's the next step, right? Yeah. So there's there's some other, some other ways of managing this. Once you've got that step to find, now let's bring the Aspire to it. Like what, what is, shifting the mindset is useful no matter what. Finding meaning and purpose in what all of these things are going to do, that's going to be valuable and help us move to the challenge. I'm not saying that every single time we're going to be successful at this. Sometimes, whoa, no, there's too much. And you you just, you know, you go crazy. That's okay. We're going to be in threat response sometimes when we're, especially times like this with the pandemic, where there's so many demands and so many new things. And and we keep hoping we're going to get back and and one of the... One of the big things, this is an aside, but one of the big things is I just hate, no, in, in two months, we're going to be back to something sort of normal. So then we'll do these things. Mm-hmm. Stop. We yeah. are, we're at a nadir of unhappiness, of stress, of loneliness. We need to act now, not, oh yeah, because we've been doing, oh, it'll be better in two months all year long. <laughs> so now's the time we need to say, all right, I know I'm stressed, but I need to do something to help my people. I need something to do to help us. So, yeah. so yes, there's going to be overwhelmed times, and at the same time, bring as much, when you can bring these tools to to what's what's happening. 
Yeah, we have a concept in Winning Well that we call, you know, infinite need, finite need. Yeah, infinite need, finite me. And at some yeah. point, you know, you have to say, which are the things that I really need to nail? And uh, I had a boss one time who said, handed me a scorecard and she, uh, you 27 items on it. She said, which of these are you going to fail at? And I said, I'm not going to fail at any of them. You know, I'm an A player. She's like, no, it is impossible. Jeez. Yes. We're going to nail all of these. So when you start dropping balls, I want to make sure you and I are perfectly aligned of which are the balls to drop and which are the ones that are really going to add the more meaning and value to the business. Yep, I love uh, that. So uh, also, I had a boss during th that very similar time frame. Uh, his name was Ray Wierspicki. And I will never forget this, this comment. I said to him, because I was feeling totally overwhelmed, and I said, Ray, aren't you stressed? And he said, you know... I don't get stressed, but I heard that I am a stress carrier. <laughs> and I thought that was one of the most uh, self-aware and wise things that he could say as a leader. And as I have grown in addition, you know, as my teams got bigger, and now that you know we're running our own company here, I, yeah. I think about that comment all the time. Because sometimes you could not be stressed because it's not that big of a deal to you. Right. Like, you know, so I could say to my team, you know what, I really think we just need to change the approach to the website in this particular area and, um, you know, do just redo the program so it creates a better client experience. Well, that's, I'm not wrong. That's easy to say. But what I don't may not be aware of is the what I've just asked people to do and how much time that's going to take and how much. And so they're getting all stressed. Right. And I'm not stressed because I'm just doing what's right as the leader of the business. Right. So how do you what do you, would, advice do you would you say if, for our more senior folks listening, you know, who may be a stress carrier, but have learned to manage the stress themselves? How can they help their teams? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is don't use any of this research to say it's OK to keep stressing and adding more to your team. That's this. This research is real and we know that we can move into a challenge response. We want to help. We want to help our people do that, but not by throwing more at them. And I love your story of like, which balls are you going to drop? Like having those conversations is really important because that helps them prioritize what is most important for the team. So I think I think that's just a great example. Hey, which of these projects can you drop, and which are the ones that really are going to drive the most value? Mm -hmm. um, there's also a for for people that really take to this to the Aspire tool set. There's some really great research by Jeremy Jameson that shows if you're working with someone who has learned these tools and so is figuring out how to channel their stress, you'll learn that even without being told explicitly. Mm -hmm. The two people working together, when one person has sort of been trained in the sh shifting mindsets and finding meaning, the other person will start to just sort of, I don't know how it works, exactly osmosis, or they see it by example, or they just hear different perspectives that that person's bringing. And then they're able to take that and actually bring that same shifted mindset to a new, to a different project and a different team. So, you know, obviously if you naturally are just not, not stressed or you've worked on some other ways to do it, that's not as helpful. But if you've been, if you've concentrated on this and actually utilizing these tools, they, they're infectious. Which is I, I really think helpful. that so much. I am thinking about a boss that I had one time and she was chronically stressed right? She just, everything was just an emergency. And she's like, aren't you spinning? Aren't you spinning? Like she would call and say that to me all the time. And I'm like, gosh, I wasn't spinning until you called. And now I am. <laughs> now I am. And I wasn't like, I wasn't working, you know, I was caring. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think we do need to, as leaders, we really do need to pay attention to the vibe that we're putting out for people. And if we can channel our own energy and, and even if we're stressed on the inside, saying, what are we, what am I doing to my team by the way I'm showing up in this particular moment? Yeah. Uh, and that's something so huge in every, every, every change we want to make. Let's make sure we're changing ourselves first. Yeah. And I've written, I've written each of these strategies as, all right, focus on you. Here's the, here are the tools. Here's what you can do. Here's how you can implement it best. Here's some habits to do. And then, and then the second half of the chapter is, all right, now how do we share that with our team? How do we spread it? How do we make those things functional for everyone? Yes, I love, love, love the way at, at the end of every chapter, you have really practical things you can do for yourself. 
and then mm-hmm. really practical things you could do for your team. I, I mean, you know, I'm all about practical. Yeah. Like, yeah. And so you could, you just say, I could do that tomorrow with my team or I could do that tomorrow for myself. All right. I'm going to just encourage anyone who has a question uh, to please type it in. I saw that we do have one from uh, Louisa. Uh, how do you control your stress levels at work when the result is out of your control? What, what would you say there? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, any which way it's useful to go into the Aspire tool set, right? Because there's there's things you can do to as much as you can to optimize whatever outcome you want, right? So doing the things you can, but also stepping back. And I mean, I, just the very fact that she said, I don't control that is a, a step that so many of us can't do. <laughs> that we don't see that there are things in our control and out of our control. So all we can do is sort of roll with it and say, you know, okay, I've done what I can. Mm-hmm. And now it's up to, now it's up to fate. Now it's up to whatever random client's going to say yes or no. Now it's up to whatever, whatever is going to happen. Um, and so for, for a lot of people, just by separating that can take that off of their stress and it, and it reduces the amount of stress that happens. But if it's there, you work with it. All right. Well, there's still meaning in in all the work that you did. So what's the value we're going to get if that goes, you know, if if we get a green light, <laughs> what's yeah. and and what's the value if we get a red light? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that uh, that's a that's a really interesting way to think about it. There is still meaning even if it didn't go the way you wanted, right? Yeah. That's, what is I've what got is, a good friend who talks about, you know, it's the it's the direction, not the distance. Oh. You know, and, and maybe that's not a good, you know, it's always, as long as we're doing our work to go in that direction, we're going to ultimately get there. And it might not be right here. And, you know, of course, well, what did we learn? And what did, what can we, how can we grow from this? But as long as we're pointed in the right direction and we know where we're going, we're going to keep trying and we're going to go around that obstacle and we're going to figure something else out. Um, yeah. John Halcyon Stin is a, a good friend of mine who's, who's, philosophizes and talks. I, I love that one. It's the direction, not the distance. I love so that too. Let's make sure we're rewarding the direction and the moving towards things, even if there's something out of our control that doesn't make it happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we still want to celebrate success and making goals, uh, but they need to be balanced, right? Just because we just came up a little bit short, but we got 95% of the way there, but we didn't quite get there. We still need to make sure we appreciate that um, so that people know that their work matters and then figure out, all right, how do we, how do we get that last 5%? Yep. Oh, that's nice. Okay. We just have two minutes left. So I know you have a whole book on uh, putting happiness to work. And I picked one chapter that I thought was most yeah. relevant for our folks, but you know, do you have, if you had to leave us with one or two other insights around what do you do to put happiness to work? What would you leave us with? I think the the most important thing from a leader's perspective is we need to talk about engagement, not as higher productivity, a higher profitability, or seeing my teams committed and willing to, to go the extra mile. That's not motivating for your people. But if we talk about engagement is actually made when people are engaged, they feel enthusiastic. They feel excited. They feel inspired. They feel proud. They feel like they belong. They're part of a team. They feel like their work matters. So let's focus on creating those emotions. Let's talk about and think about engagement, not as the outcomes we want to see, but instead as the process, which is if we can find our way, the way to help our people feel these activated positive emotions I was just talking about, which is happiness, Mm -hmm. specific types of happiness, then we're going to all be pulling in the same direction because people don't care about their engagement, but they care a lot about their happiness. So- Let's position engagement as activated positive emotions. Let's do the seven strategies in the book, which all increase both. And that's really the way forward. I love that. It's, you know, you come to me and say, hey, I want you to be more engaged. Uh, Hey, I really care about you and I want you to be happy. Radically different, radically different. Well, Eric, it has been absolutely wonderful to talk with you today. Thank you so much for the contribution that you are making to leaders around the world. I'm excited for your new book. So uh, thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. I really appreciate it. 
Okay, so next uh, week we have Hillary Blair, and she is going to be talking about executive presence and advanced communication skills to show up as a really strong and confident leader. So thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you next time. Thank you.